Hello, everybody. Warm welcome from Frankfurt, from SAFE, which is the acronym for Sustainable Architecture for Finance in Europe. Uh, our mission is basically, or the name SAFE is basically telling our mission, which is we try to analyze and also discuss issues which have implications from financial markets on societal activities. So it's about uh, understanding what's going on in terms of its implications for allocation of capital, for stability in financial markets, for overall uh, societal well-being. My name is Hans Helmut Kotz. I'm a long-standing affili affiliate of the uh, Institute. And by the way, Marcus told me not to tell that, Uh, but I actually do have an account with the central bank as a former employee of, of Bundesbank. So but that's, uh, that's our question. So why don't we all have uh, accounts with central banks? Why aren't central banks involved in, um, in retail banking? That seems to be a rather pedestrian and, and, and simple question, but it uh, was for a long time not discussed and only gained in intensity over the last... 10 years perhaps, and it would be interesting to understand why this uh, renewed interest in the issue came up, because it's in, in fact a rather old one. Um, in the early 2000, by the way, this was discussed mainly under the, from the perspective of, of engineers, people who were thinking about crypto. Um, and Tobin in the mid 80s and Wixel in the late 80, 1990s actually also had similar ideas. So why did it come up? What's the reason for that? Well, maybe per perhaps because breakout conditions have changed significantly in terms of technologies, capacity of computers to, to, to handle massive amounts of, of data, but also since we saw um, platforms, big so social media platforms thinking about creating uh, such currencies. And that might come with all sorts of, of, of issues. So this is basically what we, what's, what's our uh, topic uh, today. And we are really fortunate to have uh, outstanding uh, panelists. Um, let me start with uh, Benoit Curé, who used, uh, who is now heading the uh, financial innovation hub of the central bank of central banks the um, BIS in, in Basel. Uh, so he's doing more than uh, the central bank digital currency, see anything around innovation. And he used to work as a um, board member at the ECB, where he was in charge, Benoit, je m'excuse, for the boring stuff, the engineering stuff, uh, uh, markets and um, payments. Uh, And he, before that, he has been uh, at the Tresor in, in Paris and also heading the debt management office in, in, in France. He's written a numerous amount of articles and, and books. One of the most uh, interesting ones is in the fifth edition, co-authored, on political economics. Just, just came out a, a couple of months ago. Our second panelist is Markus Brunnermeier from Princeton University. And I always have to, to read out these names because I never get them right. Edward S. Sanford Professor at Princeton University and Director of Princeton's Bentham Center for fin Finance. Marcus is one of the uh, most um, uh, prolific writers in anything around monetary policy, financial policy and, 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 and around. And he is an, an incredibly impactful author, impactful not only in terms of citations, but really impactful in terms of um, practical implications. Uh, his PhD was about um, liquidity spirals, if I recall it correctly. That was work done long before the crisis in 2007, 2008, ultimately was exactly about that. He was working on Uh, measures to understand systemic risk. He, he, he thought about how to create a synthetic uh, asset-backed 
security for, for Europe. He thought about what is the threshold of interest rates, policy rates, which make monetary policy counter, counterproductive and so forth. But he's possibly most reno renowned meanwhile for his Marcus Academy, uh, which where, where, we ha where he has lots of outstanding uh, discussions. So those are our two pr uh, presenters. Uh, game plan. The, the, the two of them will give an introduction of about 10 minutes each. We will have interaction on, on the panel and we would love to invite you uh, into our discussion. So please use the uh, Q&A um, and please uh, contribute to our, to our dis uh, discussion, which is most effective if you write the, up the questions rather concisely. And please also Uh, give us your affiliation. So without further ado, I hand over to Basel. Thank you very much, uh, Hans Helmut Tender. Thank you for uh, having us today. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be, to be here um, to, discuss, uh, to discuss such an important topic. Um, I would have much preferred to be uh, with you in Frankfurt, uh, which uh, was my uh, It has been my, my hometown for eight years, but, uh, but Basel is good too. Uh, and it's nice to, uh, to, to see you on screen and to have such a, such a wonderful audience. So um, I, uh, I just have two slides. So it's a, it's a kind of two course menu, uh, but uh, like in any civilized, civilized place, there is also a starter and a dessert. So uh, I start with a starter, which is the next slide. And that's a, that's a, that's a cartoon I, I, I found in the, in the New Yorker. Uh, which uh, gives you a little bit uh, the what was the mindset of central bankers uh, until recently uh, when it comes to the uh, digitalization of money. And uh, I mean, you will judge at the end of this seminar uh, whether this has changed. I would, uh, I would, uh, I would argue that this has, has changed quite a bit over the last uh, years and even months for reasons where we're going to discuss tonight. Um, and so, starting with my first substantial slide, uh, which is the next one. Um, I would I'd, I'd first like to, um, to, to try to understand and discuss why our central banks should uh, go in the, uh, in the digital, digital space uh, and, uh, and issue digital money. Uh, and, the, and the following slide will be about the how. What are the, what are the, the, the design questions that we're asking ourselves? And, uh, and, 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 and there will be a number of, of questions that will be in the discussion. But let, let me start with the why. Why are we having that discussion tonight? Um, I think first and foremost, because technology has been changing very fast. That has been highlighted by Hans Helmut. Uh, that has, that has uh, unfolded in several uh, steps or stages. Uh, first, we've seen uh, new uh, customer facing interfaces um, that uh, uh, increase the convenience uh, of payments for the, uh, for the customer. And, um, That already came, uh, uh, when, in particular, when it comes to mobile payments, with uh, with the uh, 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 with the flavor of things to come. That is that the uh, the backbone of the system uh, may may change, uh, maybe in a radical way. If you think of M-Pesa in Kenya, for instance, uh, that's a mobile interface, but uh, you don't need a, a bank account to use it, uh, and so uh, it already comes with the uh, the premise or the threat uh, of of decent uh, decentralization of banks, uh, which was a kind of uh, the flavor of things to come. Uh, and then we have, the, of course, uh, the, the development of crypto uh, assets, uh, Bitcoin being the most, uh, the most uh, prominent and famous. Uh, that is, uh, 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 crypto assets coming with their own platforms outside of traditional payment systems. Uh, and then uh, in 2019, you had this uh, proposal by uh, Facebook, Libra, now called DM, uh, what we call a global stablecoin, coming also with, with, with its own platform. Uh, and what was widely perceived and still, still may still be perceived as a closed loop system, not relying on traditional payment uh, infrastructures uh, and possibly operating as a walled garden controlled by, the, uh, controlled by, uh, by, uh, by one company. Uh, and uh, in the background, you also have a decrease in the demand for banknotes in the use of cash. Um, banknotes are still in high demand, in particular in the Eurozone for, uh, as stores of value, uh, but uh, uh, increasingly less so as, uh, as a means of payments. And that trend is, 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 is very fast in countries such as Sweden or China uh, and, 
and then it is unconscious. Um, and so that begs the question of whether the, the payment infrastructures as we knew them are still, uh, are still fit for purpose. And so central banks have, wake, have, have been waking up to this perspective and they've, been, they, they've tried to think hard about the different possibilities. Um, and um, first, um, they've seen a, a possible future where uh, consumers, individuals, households, that is citizens, uh, wouldn't be, uh, would, would not avail anymore of the access to central bank money uh, in their daily transactions. Because if you use only uh, credit cards or uh, 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 fancy interfaces connected to your bank account, uh, that's not uh, a claim on the central bank that is being used as a means of payment. So there is this loss of, 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 of a relationship between the central bank and the, and the broader audience and the citizens, uh, which is a concern for central bankers. Uh, and also central bank money plays a key role uh, in, at the heart of modern uh, financial systems. Uh, central bank money is the safest of all possible settlement assets. So it is the only one that can uh, uh, ensure in a, uh, in, a, in a super safe way the finality of payments, uh, because payments are, uh, ultimately take place between accounts at the, uh, at the central bank. While uh, with commercial money, uh, it always depends on the credit worthiness of the uh, of the uh, of the bank that is uh, providing the commercial money. So, certain and, and finality of payments is really at the heart of the functioning of the global financial system. Uh, also, uh, it allows to provide uh, what uh, what academics would call outside liquidity uh, in the uh, in the Armstrong and Tyrol sense. That is. Uh, when uh, when the system is uh, is strained, uh, when there is when liquidity is, uh, is is missing, is drained in the system, you need someone to provide outside liquidity, and that's not possible uh, if uh, liquidity is entirely uh, provided by commercial players inside of the system. So this, that's the lender of last resort function, if you, if you want that you want to preserve as a as a social function in case of crisis. And finally, it's commercially neutral. So it doesn't come with um, um, with uh, um, uh, um, uh, 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 cross subsidies or uh, the central bank is not never not going to use your data uh, to make money out of it because it's not part of its mandate. Uh, and so uh, that's very important because central bank money then can be at the center of the system uh, and can be the basis on which a number of commercial propositions can be built. Uh, but the basis itself, the cornerstone, has to be neutral from a commercial standpoint, and that's what central bank money can provide. Hence, this all this uh, uh, burgeoning of discussions, ideas, plan, uh, prototypes on uh, central bank digital currency. And my second slide is about the, the powers. No, the previous one. And there are a number of key questions uh, which we are asking ourselves, and I'm not going to answer any of them actually, uh, just just to highlight the complexity. Of the discussion and the fact that the fact that it's full of trade-offs, it's full of trade-offs. So you've got to choose your model, your, your design, uh, your design model for CBDC, being mindful of the trade-offs and having clearly in, main, in mind the uh, the public policy objectives that you want to reach. So there is no single way to do it. One question is, uh, what is it you're trying to achieve? Is it only about uh, securing the role of central bank money as a settlement asset at the core of the system? Um, and maintaining this relation, this link between the central bank and the citizens, or do you want to kill several birds with the same stone and achieve other objectives? So you may want to uh, you may want to change the way monetary policy is implemented and uh, and be able to bring uh, interest rates in a in a deep negative territory also for, for individuals. Uh, that's a monetary policy objective. Um, you um, uh, you. Um, uh, you may want to uh, to disintermediate to 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 to, to encourage the, the entry of non-bank players for the sake of innovation, for the sake of competition. So you may want to actively push or uh, uh, promote competition in the system at the expense of banks, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, but depending on the on the objectives, uh, there will be different uh, solutions. And my my take here, by the way, is uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, central bank digital currency should uh, should be as neutral as possible when it comes to these other objectives. That is the main the main objective should be to preserve the role of central bank money uh, as a means of payment. Uh, central banks are in the in the business of providing means of payment. Central banks are not in the business of providing uh, deposit accounts for commercial purpose, uh, and they are even less in the business of investing in the economy. And I think that would be an enormous mistake to push central banks into that kind of direction. Uh, which uh, kind of uh, incites to be very careful when it comes to the other objectives. Um, 
Second, second question is about uh, is about diversity. You want uh, you want the private sector to thrive. You want innovation to thrive in the private sector, uh, and so certainly CBDC has to be some kind of partnership between the public and the private sector. And a lot of the elements of the system have to be provided by the private sector, not by the public sector. Third question is about privacy. And here also you have a fundamental trade-off. Uh, consumers uh, want privacy, they value privacy a lot. Authorities not that much because they also want to fight crime. Uh, they want to know what's going on. They want to be able to enforce uh, uh, anti-money laundering uh, 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 regulation, uh, anti-terrorism and so on and so forth. So here also there is a balance to be found. Um, technology is an open question. Uh, you want uh, the system to be uh, to be open. Uh, you want it to be fast, uh, but you also want it to be safe, uh, and particularly safe to cyber attacks. Uh, and there is no there is no single solution. Um, openness is also an issue. Uh, I'm going to be short on this because Marcus has written a lot uh, uh, important papers with uh, with Harold James and Jean-Pierre Landau. So I don't I'm not going to go there, but I would be happy to to have that discussion later on. Uh, what about offshore use of CBDC? Uh, what about the impact of an e-dollar uh, or an e-euro uh, or an e-CNY on smaller open economies? And do you want to put a, a safeguard there? Um, and finally, there are kind of tactical issues or timeline issues. Uh, central bankers are prudent. They are very, very prudent and cautious uh, people as they should be. So we want to take as, as much time as needed to do it the right way and in a safe and robust way and resilient way. But on the other hand, the world is not waiting for us. And you have these new payment solutions emerging, particularly global stable coins are emerging. And so you have a kind of a timeline issue here. Uh, if you wait for too long, uh, maybe big tech companies will jump in and will lock in some kind of uh, first mover advantage. And it will be much more difficult for public authorities to, uh, to shape the landscape. Uh, and so you may want to be faster, but can that be at the expense of safety? Certainly not. And that's another fundamental trade -off. So I will just stop here, having asked, asked all these questions. And my last slide, which is a dessert, is about what I do in Basel, that is a BIS Innovation Hub. Uh, we have currently uh, five CBDC-related projects uh, in our three centers in, uh, in Switzerland, in Hong Kong, and in Singapore. And I'm glad to also to add that uh, the day after tomorrow, Friday this week, we will open a new center in London, uh, and very soon also another center in Stockholm, uh, with a, a number of Nordic central banks, uh, and later in the year in Paris and Frankfurt and in Toronto. Uh, and so it's not all about CBDC, but we are glad to support uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the work of the, uh, of the global community, because we believe that any answer to the questions I've been asking has to be to rely on uh, international cooperation, and it also has to rely fundamentally on experimentation. You've got to learn from projects, prototypes, pilots, uh, proofs of concepts. And that's exactly what we're doing here in Basel. I've been too long already and I stop here. Not really too long, but you've been excellently pointing out the why and the how. And the, uh, the why has to do, if I got it correctly, mainly with preserving the, um, the role of central banks in, in payments and hence also the capacity of central banks to run monitor policy, pursue its, its ultimate objective. So it's a derived objective. And if I understood it correctly also, you highlighted the, the issue, to what degree are payments public goods in terms of the typical reason why you would go about coming in with the public sector, namely because there are externalities, in this case, network externalities, and hence also very strong competition issues. And one of the driving forces seemingly has been that there's platforms who, who are monopolies or quasi monopolies threaten to undermine the capacity ultimately of, of central banks to pursue their ob objectives. And yes, I, um, I, 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 if I may, I, I sometimes call it the, uh, the Lampedusa principle. That is, uh, if you want everything to remain the same, then everything has to change, right? So if central banks want to keep delivering price stability and financial stability, they've got to radically change the way they do it. But that's just to keep doing what society expects them to do, nothing more. That's a perfect way to hand over to the East Coast. Marcus. 
Thanks a lot, uh, Hans Elmus, and thanks, Benoit, for your remarks. So it's, a, it's an honor to be part of this uh, event, and uh, thanks to all the participants for listening to us. So I want to go back to something Hans Helmut mentioned is very much what were the technological trends which actually drive uh, the changes. And I think it fits very nicely what Benoit said, uh, you, the world is changing and if you don't change with it, uh, things will change without you. So essentially we had several trends and I'll just focus because of the time constraints on a few of them, but you know, we had the smartphone with MPSA, we had Bitcoin and all these things, we have tokens. But the big change really is that we have new ways to analyze big data with artificial intelligence, deep learning, and other things. And that changes the whole finance landscape. So traditionally we have banks in the middle and customers are at the ends, but now we have the platforms uh, in the middles and the banks are just part of the platforms. So and the question is what financial model do we want in the long run and what are the implications for the central bank universe or for banking more generally. And I want to like give you some thoughts about this and how this connects with central bank digital currency and why we should have or not have an account with the ECB. Of course, there are more things like smart contracts, smart money, programmable money, and many, many things. You can do micropayments, you can buy one newspaper article for a cent, which you, know, you couldn't do earlier and so forth. So let me just put the picture a little bit in, in the historical context. So traditionally, we have essentially a two-tier system. So we have the government, the central bank, providing the unit of account, and that allows the government or the central bank essentially to conduct monetary policy because they control the unit of account. And we have many issuers of money, but we have only one money. So there's one euro, but you know, if you go, your private bank account gives you some deposits and that's also issuing some money. So it's just some inside money being issued. That's on the private sector. The whole thing is a public-private partnership. But in the future, there's a new player coming in. In the future, these platforms and the big tech companies are coming in. So we have a three-way future arrangement and we have to make a decision how will this three-way arrangement look like and how will it change the whole landscape? And that's what Tom Selmos was alluding to it as well. And if there's time at the end, I will also say there's also, because technology is changing, there's new international competition. So you might lose your currency. That's not such a big deal for the euro area. They're fairly protected. But for many emerging economies and small emerging economies, you know, Facebook or some other currency, uh, private currency might take over the currency. And that's what they're concerned about. And then you have to think about, should we offer a more digital version of our own currency in order to protect our currency? Now, let me split it in three parts. First, if you want to adjust our world to the new world, how would you regulate the interaction between platforms and banks? But then how would you compete with the private sector through using CBDC? And if there's time about the international comp component components. Now, how would you regulate these new players in the banking system or more financial system? And that might be at the corner. And what's the advantage? And I forgot to mention that the advantage they have, they can use the payment data and combine it with other data and infer information. And 10 years, 20 years ago, we didn't have this technology to really get all the information out of the payment data, combine it with your a Twitter data and whatever other data they have and combine it and do better predictions, give you better recommender system, uh, give you, you know, better default uh, predictions about the credit worthiness of, of uh, various players and so forth. And as was alluded to as well, there are positive network externalities there. So there's a tendency towards a natural monopoly and payment also then tends to this a natural monopoly. There will be very few big players and the big issue on this regulatory front is the question of interoperability. So do we want, uh, you know, that once you have a platform, the platform is essentially open to others as well. And if you want the uniformity, if you want to preserve the uniformity of money, we essentially have to enforce some interoperability. And there are many issues, and uh, Benoit alluded to many of these issues, and I don't have time to go into it, perhaps in the discussion will come up uh, more, but there are many issues whether you would like to have interoperability in the tokens. So the private platforms will give out tokens. Are there stable coins? Oh, they might be subject to runs because they're very interoperable. Or you know, if they're not, they create its own currency. That might be undermining the, uh, 
the monopoly of what central banks have to conduct monetary policy. So that these are different issues. And as E. Benoit mentioned, these are all trade-offs one has to balance and find a new gate. And we didn't have these problems so concretely before we had this new technology. Of course, we had a free banking area in the United States in the 19th century, which similar issues came up all the time, but it comes now in a different context and it revives all traditional questions about money again. And it's an exciting time in terms of doing research. So the one thing is we have to figure out how we regulate the competition among the private players. So within the group of platforms to make sure the platforms compete with each other and there's not one platform dominating everything. And then also between the banks and uh, the big techs. And we have to figure out, do we want the banks to become platforms and, or we, do we want to protect the banks from the big tax? And how do we want to, that's a big question, essentially regulatory design question, how we want to do that. And in this game then comes, or this situation comes the question of CBDC, central bank digital currency. How should we do this with this new way what the central bank should do? So first of all, I think it's very important the government is on the defensive here in a sense that the government is issuing cash and the citizens of a, of a country have access to the cash. And that's the ultimate anchor where you can go. You have the right to, with the bank to go to your bank and say, I would like to have the cash provided by the government. As cash goes away and you can't buy anything with cash anymore in the, down the road because it will be the case that everything will be digitized. Sooner or later, this tendency will go. You cannot convert it to something anymore. The anchor is not there anymore. So the central banks have to think, should, what should be the new anchor? And the new anchor could be CBDC. So in order to compete, in order not to be disconnected, what the citizens can hold, CBDC is one of the answers. And one has to think about that. Of course, you might say, this is actually at the expense of the private sector. What's wrong with the private sector providing that? Uh, so far, it's going pretty well too. But so far, we have a setting where we have a PPP, private public partnerships, and the banks provide some deposits while the government provides the cash, the ultimate anchor for the citizens, and every citizen can go there. If we don't do anything, the anchor is drifting away. So the question is, do we have to replace it with something else? And on the other side, people argue from uh, the private sector that, you know, if you allow the central banks to be so competitive with the private sector, there's a risk of disintermediation. There might be runs. Whenever there is one bank in difficulties, you now can run into the ECB or the Bundesbank or whoever it is. Uh, and then you run into some safe haven because we have provided a very safe haven to the central bank. But I think this argument is, is a little bit misleading. And I, let me just spend one minute on that. Uh, running into uh, the ECB, because it's very safe, uh, that's not, whenever there's a bank difficulties, you can run into something else too. You know? There's always one particularly safe bank you can run into. So it's not that you really have no safe haven in the existing system. But you might argue the, the whole system might go down. But then you can still run to the foreign country. And then it makes the system even worse. Isn't it better to have a safe haven within your currency area where you can run into rather than running into a foreign country? So I think given that in terms of stability issues, I think having CBDC where people can run into the something within your currency area is more stable than the run out of your currency area. And if it's only one or two banks, they can anyway run into some other private safe bank. So I think the run argument, I don't buy. And there's another argument, which goes back to a paper I've written with Dirk Nippelt. Uh, it's essentially uh, when you run into a bank, what you do, right now you withdraw cash, you take it out of the bank. But if you run into the ECB, what you say, you tell your private bank, please transfer my money, my deposits to the ECB. What does this mean? I, if I run on my private bank, I have a claim to my Raiffeisen bank or whatever bank it is. Uh, and then I can actually, uh, this claim goes to the ECB, but then the ECB automatically has a claim towards my private bank, my former private bank. So it immediately lends to it. So if, if the ECB accepts this transfer, it immediately goes in a credit arrangement with uh, the, the private bank. 
So it's not a run. So the ECB, the, the private bank is now not a liability towards me, but they're now a liability towards the ECB. But it's just a change of who is more liable, uh, whom the bank, the private bank is liable to. So it's a different form of run. It's much less destabilizing. And one has to take this into account. It's often ignored in, in the debate. Now, so what's a, what's a CBDC? It's an account with the uh, central bank and... Uh, Hans Helmut has already won. He's ahead of us, uh, he told us just now. Um, and, and so why do we want CBDCs or why we're thinking about CBDCs again is to grant citizens essentially access to public money, which they have through cash now, and they might not have it down the road. Of course, there are other reasons too. Some people want to get around the zero lower bound. Uh, there's, there are reasons that, you know, there's cybersecurity issue. You might have a system where you can fall back to because uh, private banks uh, might go down because of cyber attack from abroad. So there are many, many issues uh, which come up and the many trade-offs Benoit pointed out. But there is an issue with the timing in the transition. So if you introduce the CBDCs, uh, in particular, if you go away from a very bank-centric world we have right now to more platform-centric world, it might hurt certain banks in this transition. I think the bigger transition is not going towards CBDCs. It's much more going from a bank-centric traditional way, borrower, lender, deposit-taking bank, rather than to a platform world. And this transition might be tricky, but one has to think, do we want the transition towards a platform environment or want to stick with a separate banking environment? And, uh, and that's essentially uh, what's going on. So let me just... Um, skip over that, there are a lot of issues how you split the task apart, you know, what will be done, should be done by the government, the official sector in terms of record keeping, settling, settlement and so forth, and what should be done at the customer interface where typically the customers, uh, the, the private banks are much better in doing the direct customer interface. I should want to say one more thing, of course, once you have a, a CBDC, you can also make it programmable and that's looking into China, which is of course ahead in this dimension big time. In the future, you can actually design uh, stimulus packages in a way which are much more targeted. And then there's the question to what extent it is. So it's always a problem that, you know, when you want to stimulate an economy, you give some checks, like in the US, you give some checks and then people don't spend it or they spend too much. So in China, what they did, at least on a local level in Hangzhou, they decided to give coupons which expire. So you can give some money uh, and if you don't spend it, they expire. So you, you don't have the problem of people are saving it away if you don't want that. Of course, you can also program it. They can only spend it on certain items and they can't buy alcohol or something like that. And that's, you know, entrenches in people's freedoms. And one has to, there are many issues coming up. One has to think carefully about it. And the other issue is if you move it too much to the public sector, to the central banks, innovation will not occur so much in the public sector, innovation occurs in the private sector. So you don't want to move it too much into um, the public sector in order to keep innovation going. So finally, let me conclude with a few so thoughts about uh, the international dimension to it. Of course, for smaller countries, dollarization is always a big issue that actually your currency will be run over by some foreign currency like the dollar. That's why it's called dollarization. So if you look in Central America, there are a lot of these countries um, having to deal with that. Once the people pay in dollars, right, contacts in dollars, you have lost the power of monetary policy. You cannot stimulate the economy by cutting the interest if nobody is using your currency and if no, no contracts are written in your currency. And if everybody is using then, you know, some private currency, you're gone. That's the digital dollarization. And if everything moves to digital space and the digital space is controlled by big private enterprises, Alibaba or who knows what, and financial, WeChat Pay and other, the big companies, they will control the monetary policy of the smaller countries. And one defense mechanism is to introduce CBDC to make the cash, which is out there now provided by the public sector, make it more usable for the 21st century. Of course, there are some other defense mechanisms too. If you're the lender of last resort, your, you know, your country will always provide lender of last resort features while these big tech companies might not. So let me uh, uh, sum up in a sense that I think the big change is the technology. The questions are, I think, traditionally traditional questions, but the technology give it a different spin, allow us to focus on a different angle. There's a big industrial organization question, 
where CBDC comes into play is to so what extent we want to open it up and want to move to a platform environment. And the big advantage there is that you can combine data from payment data with texture analysis with, you know, whether I buy a red tie or a blue tie in Altus and there are all these privacy issues of so data and privacy is all as do we want to combine that. And there might be some advantage to that. It might, you know, what I call inverse selection, all the adverse selection is shifting to inverse selection in a sense that it flips who has the information advantage, not the customer anymore, but the platform. And that is a big challenge for the banking sector. And the banking sector might become platforms on their own. And the regulators have to decide which way they want to tilt. And it's a difficult question to decide. But if you decide to go to this platform world, but because it's more efficient down the road, potentially, uh, the transition might be risky. And you have to think about that. But in generally, there will be new currencies in the future. Uh, we might have several currencies in our wallets. Uh, there are certain fintech companies which offer you 37 currencies already. You can swap from one to the next, depending which country you're in. But in the future, we can perhaps each shop can have a different currency and we can just flip back and forth. Um, whether this will come or not, I don't know. But uh, it, the, 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 the binding component, which we typically have, that we have a better feeling for the unit of count if it's in your own currency is not there anymore the same it is before. So in the future, I can envision that we have our Apple or Google classes on and you can think best in a particular currency and it just you know, your Google classes tell you in your, uh, in your augmented reality, the currency you like um, and, and, you know, which currency is really the product priced and doesn't really matter. But right now uh, we all think, you know, in euros in Europe and in Celsius in Europe and in, in US, you think in terms of dollars and you think in Fahrenheit and you're familiar with, with this uh, prices and that's uh, going on. But there are a lot of changes going on and Bitcoin and Libra uh, were some of these changes. And I think they're like Napster in the music industry. So the music industry has changed, you know, from CDs to streaming and it moved radically. Napster played a critical role, was a catalyst. Uh, Napster is not around anymore and Bitcoin is still around. Libra is replaced by DM already, but it might be gone too, but it played a critical role to wake everybody up and uh, go see what the transitions are. And I think it's, that's where we, we are standing, essentially. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Markus. What I find most, um, most helpful is a way to think about this in terms of going from a two-tier system to a three-way arrangement. And um, you also highlighted how crucial interoperability between platforms is. And of course, for platforms, it's... Um, existential not to have it so they they are they are keen on creating switching cost and on making it difficult and producing convenience so this leads to what you uh, established as an argument in terms of um, digital currency areas so going across national borders and, and creating in, in fact possibly much more fragmentation than we than we than we currently have so what I'm now confessing is I learned a lot of reading your, your papers over the last uh, few years on, on this issue. What I found also very important that matches nicely with what Benoit said, the de-anchoring. Uh, de-anchoring, which possibly means monetary policy is gone. For sure, for small open economies, most probably. But also it might, might lead to... Um, well, uh, uh, to financial stability issues in, in the larger economies. There's a great book not written by Benoit or Marcus. Uh, it's uh, Information Value, uh, Carl Shapiro and um, Hal Varian, 1989. And they have a beautiful point, which Marcus now stressed also. Technologies change. Nobody except his over 60 knows what Napster is, but functions don't. And what I liked about your work in terms of functions, because you're adding to functions which money used to perform in terms of recombining. So it's not only store of value, 
uh, means of payment, uh, means of uh, accounting. There might be other stuff coming up, and that ultimately leads to the question um, of the red, uh, red Queen in Alice in the Wonderland. Can central banks stay where they are, or have they? Do they have to adopt? And probably they do have to adopt. Um, any reactions on the panel between the two of you? Benoit. Um, no, I mean, I, I, uh, I think I have a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of agreement with, uh, with Marcus, uh, with maybe one uh, semantic disagreement which is that as much as I, I agree with his conclusion that we will see a diversity of currencies in the future, I wouldn't call that currencies. I would call that means of payment, right? And, um, and we will have a diversity of new means of payment, but we already have that. So uh, Hans Helmut, if you go to the, uh, if you want to buy a beer on the, on the Fresgasse in Frankfurt, uh, you can pay cash, you can pay with coins uh, or with banknotes. Uh, or with your credit card. Um, and if you pay with banknotes, uh, it's a claim on the ECB. If you pay with uh, coins, it's a claim of the, on the German federal government. Uh, if you pay with your credit card, it's a claim on your commercial bank. And it's already possible. So that's going to change, but we, we already have a diversity of means of payments that's going to stay. Um, and what I, what, I wanted, what I would like to argue, what I've tried to argue is that the existence of central bank digital currency is in a way a guarantee of this diversity. It's a guarantee that the, uh, the, the future of payment will not be hijacked by a few uh, big companies uh, exploiting the uh, network externalities and, and strategic complementarities uh, that Marcus have, has, has described as uh, complementarities between access to data, uh, uh, ex the existence of a network, uh, which can allow you to develop activities uh, it all goes together and creates complementarities with huge uh, 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 increasing returns on scale. So, if you want to protect uh, diversity, uh, you need a uh, you need a neutral means of payment at the center of it. But then there will be diversity, and so I'm not even sure that CBDC will be massively used in the retail. Uh, it just I just want it to be available to citizens. Uh, I think it would be unfair, and it's 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 almost a political statement, <laughs> if I may. I think it would be it would be unfair if the the safety and convenience of central bank money would be available only to big banks, to com to bank to commercial banks, which is the, the future where we are headed if CBDC doesn't come, because banknotes will uh, will uh, will be less and less used, and so I think it's a duty to offer this possibility, this option to citizens, and then they can choose to use it or not to use it, and it's fine, and it will, it will be for them to decide. Markus? Yeah, let me just uh, point, make it a little bit more pointed. I mean, it would be unfair that only Hans Helmut has an account with the Bundesbank. Exactly. Uh, no, 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 no. 20,000 people at a minimum. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I totally agree. I think that the uniformity of uh, money is important to preserve, that uh, you know, there is one currency which serves as the anchor. And the question is, can you preserve the anchor without having any way to convert it into the anchor or only certain banks can convert it into the anchor. And the big question is, do we need for that CBDC or is it enough that the banks hold the serves on their own and swap this in the surf? Of course, you could argue the fact that the central bank provides a lender of last resort function makes the banks very likely to issue also, let's say deposits in euros and they might be reluctant to issue deposits in a new tech currency, which is a not the stable coin, but in some other because they don't have this land of last resort feature attached to it. You don't know whether you know, Facebook would bail out or give some extra liquidity uh, when there is a crisis to particular banks. And uh, that, that's a big, but on the other hand, if you look at Bitcoin, we see a parallel system evolving where you have Bitcoins as a reserve item and there's many exchanges and many quasi banks essentially issuing claims towards Bitcoins, which are like deposits. And, uh, and if something goes wrong, there will be anyway, there will be um, demand that the government intervenes and helps out. And that, that's it's from a financial stability consideration, uh, not very 
desirable and hence it's better to have a framework where it's all at least the stability the public good of the stability is guaranteed by the official by the public sector and can can i add a very short comment on mm -hmm. very short uh, there is indeed a risk of fragmentation which which was which was very very uh, 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 convincingly uh, highlighted by marcus both uh, internationally and also domestically but you know what that's to be settled by law right Tonight, that's tonight a discussion between economists, but we have something called monetary law that's voted by parliaments. Uh, legal tender is decided by parliaments, not by central bankers. Uh, and so we also need the legal framework that comes with it and that ensures uh, the, uh, uh, the um, um, uh, that ensures the trust uh, in central bank money uh, as, a, as a unit of account. And that's a legal discussion. And that's also why CBDC cannot only be a discussion for central bankers to have. It's also a discussion for, uh, for politicians and for parliaments and for, the, and for the public. So we need also a broad engagement on these issues because at the end, the legal framework will be decided uh, by parliaments. Let's turn a little bit um, critical. Commercial banks don't like your ideas. Um, so, Frank Westhoff, who, who used to be a commercial banker, asks, what is wrong um, with what we've been doing up to now? Didn't we supply a decent amount of accounts in a, in a proper way? Why, why, why do we have to, to change? And I, may I add to that? Joe Stiglitz liked to call banks as social accountants. And they need this account knowing information from accounts in order to conduct the other business. So it's about, um, it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a joint product, basically, what banks are offering. Aren't you guys proposing to undermine banks? Should I answer? Uh, I mean, so I, I agree that, you know, banks provide a, a good service. And so far, it's just the world is changing. And the central banks are not changing. The cash is going away. And you could say, yeah, that means an expansion of the private sector at the expense of the public sector. So that's uh, the natural tendency. So if there's, there's no action at all, then the private sector would expand. And then there comes the other dimension. What do we do with digital payment systems uh, like you know, in China, like WeChat Pay or Alipay? And, and do we allow these platforms to come in? And then probably the banks will cry, oh, we need regulation, we need to be protected from these uh, big tech companies. Uh, and then there will be a claim, oh, we did well, but there might be some social value from this information uh, out there. And there might be also some issues with privacy considerations. And you might argue the banks did a good job so far keeping privacy, they didn't exploit the data. There was also not the possibility to exploit it the same way we have now with artificial intelligence. Um, what will the banks do with their data? I don't know, but they're probably not as good in combining it with other data which comes outside of the payment components. And, and that's, I think the landscape is changing and we have to respond to this changing landscape. Uh, that would be my answer to that. But I'm not blaming the banks, but I just say they should be aware of these technological changes. I'm not blaming the music industry where uh, you know, certain companies didn't survive when you move from CD to online streaming. But ultimately, it's about the welfare of the citizens. Now, that's what we care about. And um, they have to make a case that in this changing in technology, they will provide the highest welfare for the citizens. In other words, um, if central banks don't move, banks might be put on a pretty much additional pressure from, from all those data processing, data mining, and so forth platforms. In, in any case, so it's almost, these are two independent questions. No, this, this pressure will come anyways, and there will be then a question how to regulate uh, this uh, dimension as well. But it's, it's connected to CBDC, but even if, if CBDC is introduced, then probably we move much more to a world of stable coins, which is more a world where we're familiar with what the banks are doing. They all issue euro claims, and uh, then everything will stay more the same. If we move not in that direction, we might have different units of accounts coming in from the tech sector as well. 
So that yeah. what I really find important is the point you stressed. This is about thinking uh, about public policy issues or public goods issues. And there's this famous Harvard economist, Richard Musgrave. He came up not only with the externality and so forth argument, but he also was thinking about merit goods. So merit okay. goods, merit goods, meaning yeah, there might be a reason to protect um, customers from platforms which have a capacity to, to, to make really lovely things and excuse themselves afterwards. Um, so that competition issues, but in addition, possibly these uh, th those issues. If I, uh, I mean, if, go if ahead. I just, yeah, if I just can add a word, I think, I mean, first, the vast majority of payments today are payments in commercial money, not in central bank money, and that's going to stay. That's Only 95%. Yeah, exactly. So I don't see what, why this, this, this should change. I think that the, uh, the emergence of, uh, of central bank digital currency is actually an opportunity to make sure that the, the, com the competitive landscape will be open and transparent uh, and that will not be captured by very big players. Um, and, uh, and, so, uh, and so that's uh, actually a, a guarantee for, uh, for market forces to play in a fair, in a, in a fair way. Uh, so it's, it's really a pro-competition uh, 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 move. Um, and, uh, and second, um, the, the architecture of CBDC in, 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 in most cases will, uh, will uh, make a lot of room for, for, for banks to play a role. Uh, and so um, nothing is decided, of course, but uh, it's very likely that CBDC will be distributed by banks, uh, just as banknotes today are distributed by, by banks. Are commercial bankers today complaining against the existence of banknotes? No, they're not. Why aren't they complaining against banknotes? Because they are distributing banknotes uh, through ATMs. They are buying the banknotes from the central bank and then distributing them to their customers uh, with a fee. So it's, it's a service they're providing. Uh, and so I, I would really encourage <laughs> commercial bankers to see all these, de all these developments as opportunities for, for future business and, and for providing new services to their clients, not as a threat. Look, as Shah, <clears throat> has a point which goes somehow along those lines. He's asking, what impact can central bank digital currencies have on monetary policy transmission mechanisms? That's your turf, Benoit, your former turf. Yeah, so look, um, I've thought about it. Uh, and uh, I mean, I don't think that should be the primary discussion. I think we can, we should be able to kind of separate the monetary policy discussion from the payment discussion and to see a central bank digital currency primarily as a payment discussion. I wouldn't really, uh, uh, I, don't think, I don't think any central bank should do it for, uh, with, with the purpose, with a stated objective of uh, changing monetary policy uh, transmission uh, because also for, for governance, for, for, for reasons of governance, it's not the same people who are deciding. I mean, a discussion on a, a discussion on monetary policy instruments is a discussion to be uh, to be had in a monetary policy council or in the governing council of the ECB, uh, and it's a discussion on monetary policy. Uh, and so I wouldn't I wouldn't mix the two uh, the two discussions, uh, and and particularly now when we have uh, 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 we have negative interest rates in the eurozone. Uh, I don't think that's the best place and, and time to have that discussion, uh, because you want to think about to think of it in a, in a also in a steady state where interest rates hopefully, <laughs> I very much hope so, uh, one day will be positive again, right? And um, and then you could have a discussion on, for instance, do you want uh, the, the interest rate charge on CBDC to be aligned on the money market rate, or do you want it to, to stay at zero, just like banknotes today have a zero interest rate, uh, etc. Uh, but uh, I don't think that's the right time to be having that discussion, really. And so I would, I would try to kind of keep the two discussions separate. Benoit, that's too political on my book. You're talking about the steady state, but there seems to be joint at the hip in some situations, the curse of cash. So there's a debate about, about that out there. And also your argument about de-anchoring is closely related. So, so I mean, do you, I mean, if you, <laughs> if you want, if you want me, 
if you want to push me to say that no, it, I don't. Would, it would be great to have deeply negative rate on CBDC, I'm not going to go there. I, I hand over to Markus. It's about the reversal rate. Yes. So, yes. So one thing is, of course, CBDC is useful to preserve the unit of account. And this way you preserve the monetary policy transmission. Uh, you know, if you don't have the unit of account anymore, if it moves to something else, then you have a central bank you playing in the air, essentially you have no impact. Uh, uh, so in this sense, it's positive. Um, and of course, there's a second element where you say, well, how should we design the CBDC and what can you do? And one philosoph philosophy might be that you might say it should be similar to cash. So it should be cash-like. So you might also not go to negative interest rate and things like that, uh, or just go never below the, the, the primary policy rate, what you do in reserves as well. Uh, that, I think the negative interest rate is an issue one has to be discussed and has to be thought about. Um, I've you know, thought a lot about the negative interest rate with the reversal interest rate that you can only go negative to a certain degree. And once you go further than that, it becomes counterproductive and that's where the effect reverses. Um, and uh, with CBDC, this might impact the reversal rate, how negative you can go. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it would politically be not wise to see the CBDC as a way to remove the zero lower bound or the effective lower bound. I think that's not the primary purpose of this. You can't just say, because we have now this possibility and then there will be opposition, then we can do the wrong thing for all the other reasons that we can't do monetary policy anymore. The other thing is I want to come back, but the design issues of what if you think about it, should be like cash, you also have to think about money laundering and all those things and what's the privacy issues and all these aspects, you might also think, okay, the first thousand euros you want to spend and CBDC will be, you know, Nobody can touch it. Nobody can figure out what you spend it on. So there has to be some privacy protection. I think that's equally important, the privacy concerns. Uh, of course, if you spend millions of dollars, then it, you know, police should be able to go after it. And finally, I want to say, coming back to the earlier question, I'm not afraid that everybody will rush into the, get an account with ECB. You know? That's not really what ha will happen. And it's just an outside option. Um, it's not the case when we had the chance to buy some, you know, bonds with the Bundesschuldenverwaltung, I don't know the English expression for that, where you can buy some government paper and park it with this and you don't go to your bank anymore. Because the hope is that the private sectors will have a much more smooth app and it will do much more convenient than the official sector will do it. And this way, most of the things will stay the same, but it's an outside option if something goes wrong or if, you know, if the private sector is doing something strange or is not putting enough security into cybersecurity, that there is a fallback option or there is, is something to keep the anchor. Essentially, for me, the biggest question is, you know, or the biggest issue is to keep the anchor in the euro and have this uniformity of money uh, still continuing. Yeah. In giving up generality is a, you know, no, if I may, I, I just, I just, uh, I just would like to uh, to follow up on what Marcus just said, and and you know, th there is this concern around that CBD central bank digital currency will increase the substitution between different forms of money, both domestically and internationally, and that creates quite a quite quite a lot of concern for uh, small open economies uh, uh, and uh, and the threat of increased dollarization and so on. So I. That's an entirely personal view, but I, I sometimes feel that that discussion is a little bit overdone, uh, a little bit exaggerated, uh, both uh, domestically and internationally, uh, because there are, lots, there are lots of ways you can control the way CBDC is being distributed. It's actually easier to control access to CBDC than to control access to cash. I mean, it, it's very easy to, uh, to, to travel around with a, with a wallet full of cash. Uh, well, I, I've never tried personally, I have to say, but, uh, you know, uh, there is lots of uh, there are lots of dollars and euros circulating out of the eurozone uh, for all kind of purposes, and it's very difficult to control uh, in cash in banknotes. Uh, that's one reason, by the way, why when I was still at the ECB, we decided to uh, stop printing the 500 euro banknotes uh, because we didn't really have had control over the way it was used outside of the eurozone, uh, and sometimes it was used for really uh, very murky uh, uh, activities. And so uh, CBDC is a, uh, it's, it's either an account or a token uh, in a wallet. And, and so you can hardwire restrictions, frictions uh, in the architecture. Uh, it's very easy. So if, you want to for, if you want to forbid 
uh, your citizens to use a digital, a digital dollar or a digital euro. Uh, you can do it legally through, through regulation, but you can also do it uh, uh, by uh, hardwiring that kind of restrictions uh, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the architecture. Uh, so it's uh, it's actually quite easy to do. So um, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, of course the, the kind of the monetary borders will be different because they won't be physical borders anymore. Uh, and, and I know Marcus has written very eloquent, eloquently on that. Uh, and and you might have different kind of uh, of, of of currency areas uh, because uh, the, the borders will be in the digital space. But regulatory borders and technological borders are as pervasive as physical borders. And they will stay. They will stay. So uh, the the map may look different, but if you want to ring fence your economy from uh, a digital currency, or if you want to prevent uh, overseas use of your CBDC, there are many ways to do it. Actually. So I'm not that worried. I have a very nice question from René Wells, University of Luxembourg. It's possibly for the Luxembourgian amongst us. Uh, Looks like a NASA SpaceX moment. The incumbents, central banks and commercial banks are being challenged by new entrants, likely because incumbents are not efficient and convenient enough for end users. Looks like central banks need to design a major innovation jump. Lampedusa? Yeah, but isn't the, isn't the NASA using SpaceX now? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> That was almost unfair. But I do like the argument. Isn't it about the technological environment which, which is changing, infrastructure which pushes yeah. to rethink stuff? If you just read what response to uh, Rick's Bank's papers five, six years ago and what you see now in terms of response... No, but I mean, if, I mean, very shortly. I think that's a very important point uh, that is being made, and and that that is the essence of why we should be positive about all these developments. We should believe in technical progress. We should believe in technology, and that technology, in a in a disruptive way, and maybe with coming with threats and and and, and you know and and risk of instability, um, has been pushing um, official authorities to change the way they think about payments. And it is already pushing costs down and increasing the speed of, uh, of payments everywhere, in particular cross-border uh, cross payments. Why does the G20 now have a, uh, 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 a, an action plan on en enhancing cross-border payments? That's because of all these developments, and particularly because of Libra. So I've been, I mean, I, I'm in the G7, I've been in the G7 and G20 business for, 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 for 15 years or so, even more. And we've been talking about remittances you know, for years without doing much. And now it's happening. Why is it happening? Because of this technical change. And that's going to have a massive welfare impact. That's going to, to, to be, to be a, a, a massive, a, a massive uh, support and help to, uh, to, uh, to migrant workers and to, uh, and to emerging market economies and to, and to low income countries. So let, let's just see the good side of it. There are lots of risks. Let's address the risks, but it's fundamentally Uh, it's fundamentally uh, uh, welfare improving. We have a question from Jan Kran, the director of SAFE. I just quote, Jan writes, if big tech firms can't provide financial services, will they simply replace banks one day when they also will be regulated as banks and we are back at square one? Or is the real elephant in the room central bank free currencies like Bitcoin? Like Bitcoin? What does uh, CBCD do with respect to crypto? So let me uh, perhaps jump into that. Uh, so I think there is fundamentally some difference in technology between the big techs and the regular banks. Of course, the bank, the big techs go into the banking business, um, but the, the big techs have better information processing. And there are two ways forward. One is that uh, the banks can just adopt this information processing and become platforms on their own and then combine the various data sources and uh, improve the prediction models in terms of default predictabilities and other elements. Or the big tanks uh, take over and become banks. So both is feasible. It could be also a convex combination of the two. What will decide that is probably the regulator. 
Uh, and, you know, there will be some countries moving that direction, other countries moving in the other direction. It depends probably also the lobbying effort of various groups. And um, so whether then we will have a different uh, currency, so the real elephant in the room, as uh, Jan pointed out, is depends whether the big techs are able to create their own unit of account. And Libra was an attempt. So you could see with Bitcoin, the scalability was not there and the central banks were not really concerned. They studied it and said, oh, there's no way they can do the same transactions Visa or MasterCard are handling in a minute. They cannot handle it in a week because it's just too inefficient. And, and Libra was a wake up call and showed a way forward how to do it. And the big challenge was that the Libra said initially, uh, they want to have their own unit of account. And then suddenly everybody woke up and said, oh my God, they'll take the monetary policy away from us. And that was the thing. And the question is, uh, will CBDC then protect that? So I'm coming back to this. And whether you do it in a crypto space or in a non in the crypto space, or what, you know, proof of work blockchains or proof of stake blockchains, that's still details, but it's unlikely that it will be a proof of work blockchain because, you know, the environmental impact is just way too big. And it's also way too inefficient. It's not right now, we cannot scale it up uh, in a sense. And I don't think this will be the future. And what you can, what you see, and I alluded to this earlier, you see a parallel universe evolving where you can have Bitcoin for transactions like a reserves from bank to bank. And then there will be quasi banks on this Bitcoin system offering some deposits. And then you can pay with your deposits like what we do now. And 95% of the activities happens at, at, uh, at within the bank or across the banks. And then at the end of the day, they'll just have to make a few Bitcoin transactions which they can handle in the system. And that will be a different unit of account potentially. Whether this will be Bitcoin or some other arrangement, uh, as I said, it's a little bit like Napster. So Napster for me is the analogy. I don't think it will be Bitcoin, but having CBDC makes it more likely that, the, that we stick with our current system or closer what we have in the current system. Markus, I just watched the price of Bitcoin. It went up. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Your, your, your impact hasn't been as dramatic as the one of others, but um, went south. I have a, a question from Baptiste Masno, uh, Toulouse Business School. I guess that's for, for Marcus. Is a CBCC, gosh, a solution to implement helicopter money? Yes. So in a sense, it's like a, what is the, uh, you know, people's QE. You can do that. So if I just go back to what's going on in the US, uh, you know, we send out these checks in the United States, the government send out these checks. It's very, you know, one reason why they cannot fine tune the checks is that they don't have the data and there's no technology really doing this efficiently. If everybody has an account with ECB, you could just say, look, there's an account for you now. You can have a thousand euros in the account. And as I mentioned earlier, you can make this, uh, this money, you can make it programmable. And whether we want that or not, that should be a public debate. You know, does the government say, okay, we're in a deep recession, we have to stimulate demand. Uh, you have to spend it now. I give you this thousand euros, but if you don't spend it, it will evaporate uh, after a while. And I, as I mentioned earlier, this programmable thing is tricky because you might be saying with respect to time, I can do that, that's feasible. But with respect to determining what you can spend it on is different. So it's like in the US, you get food stamps, for example, you can spend only on foods. You could do digital food stamps in a sense. Or, but then you get into individual freedoms. Now is that what can people spend it on? Uh, you give them money and they can only spend it on particular things. And for this, I think we have to go beyond central banks. This is really the sovereign has to decide. Now, this goes to political questions and it, the people have to decide that what they want, there has to be a public debate and should not be decided only by the central bankers. Yeah, I mean, if, if, I, may, if, I, may, or if I may double down on what, on what Marcus just said, I think mean, CBDC has the potential to support fiscal policy, actually. Uh, in many countries, governments don't have the right channels to, uh, to, uh, to distribute, uh, to distribute uh, grants to individuals, to households. And they've got to use, you know, development banks or postal accounts, I mean, all different ways to do it, but CBDC would be a good way to do it. But that's fiscal policy, so it should be. It's just a, a different pipeline to, uh, to, uh, to pump money uh, uh, down the last mile, uh, as, uh, as Augustin Carstens uh, when, when said. It's, it's just a new pipeline to do it. 
So uh, yes, it's possible, but that's fiscal policy. And second, programmable money I think was was mentioned by uh, by Marcus. I think it's a, it's a really interesting discussion, um, and it's it's part of the reason why I said earlier that we need to have our objectives right because there are so many trade offs. Um, Program, I wouldn't put programmable money as one of the stated objectives of, of doing CBDC. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it can be programmable in a, in a technical sense, like your uh, wholesale CBDC can be programmable if you want to, uh, if you want to, uh, to facilitate the settlement of assets, of tokenized assets in central bank money. Uh, you may want to have, to have an element of programmability so that everything can be smoothly implemented uh, on chain, on, on the blockchain uh, with central bank money. That's programmability, but in a kind of technical sense. Do you want to uh, to program a CBDC so that it can be spent on some items and not not others? Uh, I think that deserve uh, that deserves a very serious democratic discussion. Uh, I find it scary. Uh, some may want to do it, uh, for instance, order in transition, right? To issue money that be spent spent only on uh, on, uh, on on green items, uh, uh, etc. Um, I find it scary as a citizen. So that's my, my personal view. It's, just, it's a strong personal view. I'm also a little bit uh, concerned as an economist, I would say, and central banker, because uh, money has to be fungible. You want to preserve the singleness of money. So if you start creating all, all different kinds of money with the same name and the same value, but can, that can be used for different purposes, uh, you're fragmenting the monetary system, uh, and that ultimately uh, will harm the functioning of the monetary system. Thank you very much, Benoit. But of course, the last point would, would, would have nothing to do with central banking, zero. It would be merit goods, it would be fiscal policy, it would be your, your pipeline. I have an, a question for you, Benoit, by Frank Heinemann, Technical University Berlin. Which assets would central banks buy uh, to uh, compensate deposits on its balance sheet? Yeah, I mean, that's a, uh, that's a, uh, again, that's a, I mean, that, that discussion should be kept separate from the discussion on CBDC because the composition of the balance sheets are I mean, the central bank balance sheets are monetary policy instruments on their own right, right? Mm -hmm. as, we, as we've learned uh, through the crisis. Uh, and by the way, part of it is monetary policy, part of it is non-monetary policy, mm -hmm. uh, as, we, as we know. Um, and um, uh, the, uh, the composition of the assets, it has to be a monetary policy decision. And it's part of the, it should be part of the monetary policy uh, uh, discussion. Uh, and, and I don't think there should be some kind of segregated, you know, uh, custodian account to, uh, to account for the uh, assets that are uh, uh, representatives of, say, uh, of CBDC. I mean, it has to be part of the, of the broader monetary policy discussion. I have to okay, apologize. We have so many questions which I cannot pick up. Would I like to pick up one by my friend Gerhard Elling from University of Munich? So Gerhard asks, a key challenge for designing digital central bank money is to ensure both privacy protection and at the same time allow surveillance of illegal transactions. Will it be technically feasible to design such a system in a way which is foolproof against any abuse of trust? Yeah, can I just perhaps to the previous question just sure. uh, chime in one, one, thing, one quick thought. So, it comes back to the paper I wrote with Dirk Nipple. If you want to keep CBDC totally neutral, if there's a run into CBDC, the central bank can just pass it on back to the banks. No? So one thing you could say, whenever CBDC money comes in, you just fund back to the banks and keep the whole economy is the same, exactly the same. If you charge the same interest rate, what the bank would have paid the deposit holders, then the system would be exactly the same. But you want, that's one feasibility if you want to keep everything neutral. Yeah, I mean, that's a, so <laughs> we should have a seminar exactly on that because uh, when, uh, when banks borrow from the central bank, it's we collateralized, will. it's collateralized, right? Yes. Um, while when banks borrow from their customers as, as, as deposits, it's not collateralized. And so you might have an issue of, uh, you know, strains on the, on safe assets mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and scarcity of collateral uh, in that kind of environment. So we should come back to... We'll deal with, we'll, we'll discuss it offline. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. It's a good discussion.
So um, one of our participants, by the way, is Charles Guthard, and he has written a beautiful book called Information and Uncertainty. And uh, one of the uh, points uh, Charles always makes, and he does it in that book in chapter one, time is our ultimate constraint and we are about to run out of time. So I'm just left with thanking you so much for a great uh, seminar. And I hope to, to have you soon again, next time around in Frankfurt, if, if feasible. It uh, was uh, just great, just along the mission of SAFE, contribute to the public debate, and I hope in a most transparent way. Merci beaucoup, Benoit. Vielen Dank, Markus. Und vielen Dank für alle Zuhörer. Goodbye. Danke schön. Merci.